Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Ann Tilton. I'm on the editorial board of Neurology Today. And I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Fiona Balmer, who is going to talk to us about her platform presentation at the recent CNS meeting, the Child Neurology Society meetings. She's going to touch on infantile spasms, one of the more difficult, complex seizure disorders in early infancy. But even more importantly, talk about some disparities that she really found with others in, in their research. So we're gonna really discuss the disparity in receipt of standard treatment for infantile spasms. And you say a call to action. And so with that, I would love for you to highlight a bit of the important findings that you found and kind of take us through the process of what you did. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate um, this time to talk. I got to work with the Pediatric Epilepsy Research Consortium Infantile Spasms Group on this project. And we looked at the National Infantile Spasms Consortium database, which was a prospective database gathered between 2012 and 2018, um, really um, headed by uh, Dr. Kelly Nupp in Colorado. And this is a really rich resource of information about infantile spasms, which is a rare disorder that affects about two to four per 10,000 children. So I guess I should say it's rare, but not that rare in the child neurology community. And as, as you said, Dr. Shelton, it is a devastating disorder where we know that rapid treatment and treatment that um, uses very specific medications is important to try to maximize developmental outcome for these children. And some people say that really a, a week to a month of missed therapy can translate into about five to 10 IQ points lost. So we really wanna be treating these children as quickly and aggressively as possible. And we put forth the question using this database of whether children from different racial and um, ethnic groups were receiving the same care and the same standard therapy. Um, so to do this project, we looked at the database and realized upfront that in terms of um, information about race or ethnic groups, there, there was a fair bit of missing data. And so we classified children as being either Hispanic because many of the, the kids who identified as Hispanic um, were either white or they didn't list another race. So we used that as its own category. And then otherwise um, we were able to, we had a fairly large other or unknown category, which um, made up about 13% of our, our data. And then the other children we classified as either being white, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, or Asian, non-Hispanic. So that, that left us with five different groups. And what we, what we tried to answer is, did all of those groups receive the same standard therapies for both their first and their second treatment? And we focused on these two treatments because first of all, some earlier research looking at treatment one had shown slight differences, but not statistically significant ones. And also because about 50% of children who have spasms will either fail to respond to their first therapy or will remit and need a second therapy fairly quickly. And so really the first two therapies are very important for outcome. And so we, we created a combined outcome looking at those first two therapies. And what we found is about um, half of the kids in our group only used one therapy. And so we based whether they had standard therapy on what they got for the first therapy. And then the other half went on to use a second therapy. And then in order to sort of think about our outcome, we combined those first two. And so you needed to have received one of the three standard treatments for therapy one and therapy two to be considered as having received a standard therapeutic course. So getting a non-standard therapy either for one or two puts you into that non-standard course. And so in looking at that outcome of if you got it for both treatments, what we found was that there was a significant difference between children who were black and children who were white. So about 74% um, of white children got a standard treatment course for those first two therapies compared to about 54% um, of the black children. So a difference of about 20% there. The children who were in the Hispanic or Asian groups actually were somewhat similar to white children in terms of their chance of receiving a standard therapy. And the children who were in the other or unknown group also had a reduced chance of receiving standard therapy, 
but it wasn't statistically different than white children. Um, so just briefly, our, our findings were that black children were much less likely to receive standard therapy when you consider those first two treatments than white children. I think something else, when we looked at the, the treatments individually, so what happened with treatment one versus treatment two, again, we still saw differences, but it was a much smaller uh, change. So 80% of black children versus 87% of white children got standard treatment for that first therapy. And really the difference emerged when we looked at that second therapy. So that also gives us a little bit of a hint as to um, where the problem is, is coming up. It seems to be much more when we're sitting down to prescribe someone a second treatment. Um, and one other interesting thing that came out of the data was that for treatment one, one of the really important um, deciders as to whether you got standard therapy was what type of insurance you had. So children who had public insurance, Medicaid, were much less likely to get a standard therapy than people who had private insurance. Um, Obviously, that's very interesting. Um, the question is, are you going to take it to another step? Are you going to look at some of the other variables that may have impacted it or some future direction in your real research in this regard? Yeah, so I, I think within this project, we because we had such a large sample, there was um, over 550 children we were able to, to look at. We actually were able to adjust for a number of the important demographic and clinical variables that might influence what type of treatment you received. So we adjusted for the state where you received the treatment because for example, different Medicaid plans might um, dictate care in different ways. And we were able to adjust for the insurance you had. And we were also able to adjust for things like what the etiology of your spasms um, was, if you had had a history of prematurity or neonatal seizures and, and several other clinical factors that um, theoretically could influence whether a doctor would want to prescribe standard therapy versus go a different way. But I, I do think that an important part of the, the data is that these were already children who had made it to tertiary care children's hospitals. So they're sort of a select bunch to begin with. And I, I think that in terms of next steps, there's a few things we've been discussing and, and working on. Um, one is trying to do a similar project, but using claims data, um, because that would give us a, a much broader swath of the population. Um, so we've been applying for some grants to, to see if we can achieve a project that looks a little bit more um, at a more generalizable sample. Um, but I think the reason we said a call to action is because this disparity was fairly stark and was you know, surprising and upsetting as a child neurologist. And so I think that there's a number of things we probably should and can do just with this data point. Um, and first of all, from a, a quality improvement perspective, we can look at, you know, within our own institutions and probably do some retrospective and prospective work, getting a sense of how much is this affecting children that we are treating. And from a, from a personal level, I think that um, one of the things that could be very helpful is some type of standardized checklist that we could implement as to sort of, for each of us to put down our own rationale as to why we are or not choosing the most aggressive therapies. And to make sure that when we're not choosing the most aggressive therapy, it really is a medically indicated and driven reason and not, not something about um, our perception of how patients follow up for care, their ability to um, follow through with our plans. Because I think all of those things probably subtly influence us. And so trying to make sure we have a good sense of when that is becoming the reason for our medical decision-making would be very important. Um, and I think sort of on a, a bigger level, we probably also need to think about um, insurance and what is covered and what we can do to advocate for patients 